Hi, my name is Andrew Weaver, and I'm the Media Preservation Librarian at the University of Washington Libraries in Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about our homegrown solution here to uh, the mass migration of audio CDs. Really quickly, I wanted to go into the background of why we initiated this project and where we started. Our library contains by far the largest media collection of all academic institutions in the Northwest United States. And within this, we have massive amounts of audio on CDs, both commercial and unique archival materials. Amongst those archival collections, we have a broad range of collections that were both donated to us on CD, comprised of content such as irreplaceable oral records of at-risk indigenous languages, as well as a legacy of past mass digitization efforts from decades past where CDs were archived in lieu of digital files. These collections can easily be in the hundreds of CDs, so we were very motivated to find an efficient method to start moving forward on their migration. After consulting with other archives who had engaged in automated workflows for optical media, we made the decision to purchase a NIMBY USB Plus device and to pair it with the DB PowerAmp software to create Herdisk QWave pairs. While that out-of-the-box workflow seemed to work all right for our initial small test collections, we soon began to run into issues when we applied it to some of the larger archival collections, particularly those that consisted of very low-quality CDRs. I want to emphasize here that my purpose is not to denigrate a particular software tool, but just to explain that for whatever reason, it wasn't a 100% fit for our context. A part of this issue could be us desiring to archive as WAVE and Q pairs, which is a single WAVE file per CD with a corresponding Q sheet that contains information about track ordering and duration. This might be a case where we as preservationists were doing something that most users of DB PowerAmp software don't need to do, since private users ripping commercial collections often favor ripping CDs to individual files per track. What we noticed on our equipment, and again, we did not exhaustively test this externally, so this might just be a reflection of an interaction of the software and our local environment, was that when we would rip CDs, they would sometimes end up missing large chunks of data. This appeared to be due to the software's method of creating WaveQ pairs, where it would rip each track individually into the computer's temp folder and recombine into a single file at the very end of disk migration. For whatever reason, we found that some of this data was not being recombined correctly. We also desired a little more usable metadata output and logging about the capture process itself, as quite a lot of the RIP status information was dependent on the GUI. These issues led to a cumbersome workarounds, such as running background processes to log the length of every CD run through the NIMBY, and then comparing the CD run times to the WAVE files uh, after capture to find incomplete transfers. Eventually, due to the volume of disks we were processing, these extra checks became too much of a detriment to efficiency, and we began to explore other alternatives. In creating a homegrown tool for batching CDs, we drew inspiration quite heavily from the IRM Lab tool created by Johan van der Kneef at the National Archives of the Netherlands. For those who don't know, IRM Lab, which stands for Image and Rip Optical Media Like a Boss, is an integrated tool for intelligently batch ripping all forms of optical media, including audio CDs, data DVDs, and video DVDs. It does this by using the command line tools for controlling the NIMBY robot that are included in DB PowerAmp and then using Python to build an environment for ripping optical disks with the desired tools while creating package structure and metadata. Since IRM Lab still uses DB PowerAmp for the ripping of optical media, and we were trying to move away from that, we didn't end up implementing IRM Lab itself for our audio-specific collections, but I want to emphasize that it served as inspiration for our own tool by showing us what was possible. In looking into a system that would take the IRM Lab approach, we needed to find software that would work well in a Windows environment and had good control via the command line. This is due to the NIMBY being dependent on Windows. This took me a bit of time as I'm much more familiar with the Linux ecosystem and tools such as CD Paranoia that would have seemed to fit the bill well, but didn't have a comparable Windows release. Other popular tools such as Exact Audio Copy that work well for making QWave pairs on Windows would have been great, but didn't have good command line functionality. After testing out options, including a delve into the Linux subsystem on Windows, we settled on using the QTools suite of tools, specifically its command line program called QRipper which does exactly what the name implies. It rips CDs to a single file and QSheet pair and supports various levels of safe ripping using rerip comparisons and C2 checksums. I do have to say, I actually like DB PowerAmp's method of safe ripping that minimizes wear and tear on hardware a little bit more because it does it by doing multiple, uh, multiple full passes of tracks rather than back and forth approach within tracks used by QTools. But so far we haven't burned out our optical drive and even if we do, they're pretty cheap these days. Before I get into the specifics of what the tool generates, in case anyone is interested in checking it out later, here's the address for where the tool itself lives on our UW Libraries Preservation Department GitHub page. And again, the tool is using the IRM Lab approach where we use the DB PowerAmp command line controllers for the NIMBY. So DB PowerAmp is a necessary dependency even though we don't use it for the actual ripping. The tool is also written in Ruby, so you would need to have Ruby installed too. 
So as we've just talked about, the core dependencies are pretty simple. You just need to install a copy of DB Power Amp and its batch ripping add-on, the NIMBY batch drivers, and obviously the NIMBY robot itself, as well as a copy of QTools. Since we've mostly been focusing on reliable rips for this process so far, there aren't currently very many other core dependencies. But I imagine that at minimum, this will expand to media info pretty soon as it would enable some extra integrated QC checks, such as expected file length, etc., that we were running independently during the previous workflow. Once all the dependencies are there, the only setup required to run the tool itself is to plug in dependency paths into the configuration file, again, in a very similar manner to Iron Lab. Since our tool is only focused on audio CD ripping, this process is pretty simple. You just need to configure where the DB PowerAmp CLI NIMBY driver controllers are, as well as the path to calling the CLI ripping component of QTools, which is called QRipper. This simplicity is also by design, as since we envision having student workers helping us with these projects, and student workers often only remain with us for short periods of time before they move on to other aspects of their studies, we wanted something that was relatively set and forget in terms of its options and setup. Sticking with this theme of simplicity, to run the tool, there are only two mandatory parameters that must be set via flags. These are the number of disks to be ripped and the output path to the project directory. Our tool supports three levels of settings for rip verification, which correspond to the presets within QTools. This is again by design, as we wanted to keep the usage as simple as possible and avoid any need for a diverse group of workers to have to navigate editing menu settings mid-project. The rip options are burst, secure, and paranoid, with the default being secure. Secure settings means the drive will read each disk session twice. If results differ or the drive reports C2 errors, then up to 30 more full or partial read retries are done for that section. This setting was selected for default, as we found that within our situation of ripping many legacy CDR disks, that it provided the best balance between quality and speed. For our disks, we don't tend to use Paranoid much, as honestly, we have found that if after 30 read attempts fail, that the odds of us getting something off of that sector are pretty low, and logging the error and moving on is the most beneficial for the collection at large. So really the whole reason why we went this route to build out a custom batch tool rather than relying on commercial software is summed up in this slide about the outputs of the process. Every time you run a batch, the following files are created automatically. We get per disk wave files and queue sheets, as well as a queue tools log file and a console log of the rip itself. This is then followed by a per batch CSV file that includes easy to read information about any possible rip errors to allow for quick triage of problem disks. We have found that generating and storing this information provides us with much better and much more hands-off methods of verifying the quality of our batch rips than the previous method, which relied on working with a GUI-based program. Having one batch CSV file at the end allows us to quickly verify our batch rip integrity and not worry about losing that context upon closing the program down. The information captured in the logs themselves also provides a great deal of information that we can save to help provide a level of provenance about the files in the future. The QTools log, for example, contains a table of contents information about the disk. I like keeping this as an extra layer of redundancy in case anything ever happens to the paired Q sheet with the file. The console log, meanwhile, provides great information for parsing. I mentioned before that we plan on probably adding in media info file length checks. It is this console log that gives us easily parsable expected length for the disk. Having all these diagnostics available after the fact, and not just while in the process of running, has given me a lot more confidence in the transparency of our disk migration, and I found it very easy to use. Once the batch is done, the files require a little bit more processing before we archive them. The CDs are ripped into files that follow a generic timestamp pattern, so it is necessary to batch rename them all to the desired naming convention. We have a separate process to do this that is a part of the CD Ripper repository, but was by design not integrated to automatically run post-rip to give a chance for any necessary QC checks, re-rips, or any other post-rip verifications. Once the batch has been verified as being complete, the renaming process is as simple as creating a list of names in a text file in the order that disks were ripped. This will then be used to rename the RIP files and associated metadata in chronological order. One key part of this process is that the script will also automatically edit the queue sheets to reflect the new updated file name, so that the validity of the wave queue pairs is not compromised. Adding this feature has saved us a lot of time versus updating queue sheets individually, and we found it pretty easy to use. The last part of our process is separate from the ripping tool itself, but I did want to mention it both for completeness and to highlight that it is yet another area where scripting around existing open tools has provided us with an excellent alternative to commercial software. After renaming, we use a very simple tool we made in-house to batch control the command line tool for BWF MetaEdit to embed VEX metadata into the files. This includes things like parsing collection numbers and IDs out of file names, as well as contextual information about the equipment used for reformatting. Once we have this metadata embedded, the final step of our process is to use another script that converts all these broadcast wave files into FLAC files. This script crosswalks the vexed metadata into comment tags that work with FLAC 
while also using the keep foreign metadata feature of the FLAC tool to reversibly embed the original metadata. This tool also automatically updates the file queue sheet to reflect the change of extension for its paired audio file and has proved very convenient. I wanted to very briefly mention future plans for the tool. Probably the first change we are looking to make soon is to eliminate the need to specify the number of disks to be ripped, and instead to have a process to automatically turn off after a couple of load attempts where the robot finds no disk. Again, the desire here is to keep the ripping process as simple as possible to cut down on training, so this would seem to make a lot of sense for us. Also, as I said before, I also want to look into any log parsing for basic RIP QC we can do. Lastly, I need to experiment with how QTools handle CDs with pre-emphasis applied. This doesn't often come up, particularly with our archival collections, but we are a large enough library that we do contain CDs in the collection with pre-emphasis that might need to go through the preservation workflow in the future. I intend to do some testing to see what kind of flags QTools creates to reflect any emphasis detection, and then possibly to add the option for some automatic de-emphasis to be applied to a mezzanine file via FFmpeg. This isn't super high priority, but it is exactly the kind of nerdy thing that I love, so I'm looking forward to experiment. Lastly, I wanted to thank you all for bearing with me as I attempted to vocally describe a command line based process, and to apologize for not being able to be logged in to take questions live due to the awkward time difference with me in Seattle. For those who have questions or, and or comments, please hit me up via the usual methods. I felt inspired to share our tool by No Time to Wait's theme this year of transparency, teaching, and trust, both because the tool is working great for us, but also to highlight how we as an institution have benefited from all the efforts around open tools and open workflows that are present in the community both through drawing inspiration from other projects, as in the case of how Iron Lab has directly influenced this tool, as well as being directly reliant on tools, such as the output of media area, the efforts of the open software and open archiving community have made our work possible. And I'm very fortunate to be in an environment that has been receptive to advocating for open solutions. Well, that's all for me. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope to hear from some of you soon.